Well, the world is a little miserable right now, so let's dive into nostalgia and forget all about it. Yeah. Every gamer has a handful of favorites, gaming greats that crawl into your eyes and curl around the base of your lizard brain. But there was something very special and cavalier about games from the late 90s and early 2000s. Computer technology was growing by leaps each year, innovation was running rampant, and even the cultural perception around gaming itself was starting to turn from a hobby only for diehard nerds into a passion for the geek chic. No matter how you look at it, this was a unique era of ideas that planted a lot of seeds, some of which grew into prominent franchises that still stick with us to this very day. For us, and for many others, one of these formative games is the post-apocalyptic RPG classic Fallout. But that isn't the game we're here to talk about today. No, today we're here to talk about steampunk Fallout, uh, that is, Arcanum. A project spearheaded by three prominent Fallout developers, Arcanum takes place in an expansive fantasy wonderland known as, well, Arcanum, which happens to be going through a booming industrial revolution. The land and its people are filled with prejudice and uncertainty due to this dawn of a new era, and while all manner of fantastic creatures and Tolkienian archetypes are represented in its setting, Steampunk technologies have an equal share of the stage. Arcanum won a multitude of rewards and favorable reviews when it released in August 2001. The Future. It also sold well during the first few weeks of sales, although they reportedly tapered off quickly. We remember Arcanum fondly, if a bit less clearly than its iconic predecessor. So why did a game this ambitious and unique fade to the background while Fallout became an international name? If the game beat sales expectations, why did the sequel get shelved? And perhaps most importantly, is Arcanum still worth playing today? Welcome to Backlog Quest, where we'll be putting a close eye to this computer RPG classic in search of these slippery secrets. My name is Boss Sauce. And I'm Rolling Coons. And together, we, we are, are the Two-Headed two Hero. hero. Now here on Two-Headed Hero, we have a special appreciation for slow-burning cult classics. We strive to find that tarnished gold, the flawed masterpieces, the games that maybe didn't sell so well or become too popular compared to their contemporaries, but spread by word of mouth into cult followings in later years. If you've seen our videos on Jagged Alliance 2 or System Shock, well, you know what we're talking about. These humble old fan favorites formed a lot of the foundation for the big money AAA experiences of today. Before we can dive into the significance behind Arcanum's development, we must first traverse time and space to 1997, inside a division of Interplay Entertainment known as Black Isle Studios. While a significant portion of the talent behind Fallout came from Interplay, Black Isle was credited with this surprising hit of a game, and went on to collaborate with many more memorable classics, such as Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Planescape Torment, and Icewind Dale. Fallout far exceeded critical and sales expectations, and these awards were well earned by its winning combination of attitude, humor, and player agency. This lovely package was duct taped into a delightful mix of post-apocalyptic environments and stylish Atom Age retro-futurism while still overflowing with enough exploration, loot, secrets, and stats to appease any dungeoneer. Many credit Fallout with reigniting interest in the computer role-playing game. There's no question that the original Fallout, as well as its sequel, Fallout 2, both remain highly replayable, thoughtful, and fun games, even decades after their release dates. Still, not everybody had a happy slappy day. After losing faith in company leadership over team assignments, Tim Kaine, the designer slash programmer, Leonard Boyarsky, the designer and artist, and Jason Anderson, also a designer and artist, left Interplay to form a new company shortly after the initial design of Fallout 2 was finished. This offshoot was known as Troika Games. During its short seven year lifespan, Troika released three games. Three games in seven years, each one a cherished classic. Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura was the first of these, releasing in 2001. Secondly was The Temple of Elemental Evil, a hardcore PC game adaptation of one of the most famous D&D modules ever penned by Gary Gygax, which dropped onto PCs in 2003. It's still on my list of games that I keep forgetting to play now that I upgraded my computer in 2004. 
It unfortunately met with mixed reviews due to game bugs and a high level of difficulty. Also, I will add to that performance issues on older PCs. Finally, there was the rugged magnum opus Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which also suffered from bugs at release and had the unfortunate luck of releasing on the same day as Half-Life 2 back in 2004. The idea of these games being dragged across the finish line, bloody and ragged, only to be patched up after release is a compelling mental image, but slowly and surely, fans revived each one of these titles with community patches and spread the word thanks to digital distribution channels that reached far and wide in the future. Arcanum got one of the best and most comprehensive fan patches, decades after the fact. The vanilla game is locked to 800 by 600 pixel resolution, 4 by 3 aspect ratio, and dedicated full screen, none of which are ideal for the PCs of today. Furthermore, there's a fair amount of bugs and balance issues. However, good news everyone! There's a fix! Drog Blacktooth's unofficial Arcanum patch is a huge makeover for the game. It fixes a ton of bugs, increases Windows 10 compatibility, and adds support for modern resolutions and widescreen. This is one of the most comprehensive fan patches out there, and it even contains a bunch of optional mods. We're talking about reinstating cut content, DLC campaigns, experience system overhauls, a cheat menu, even new playable races. If you're looking to play Arcanum, this is probably the best way to do so. But it's a little tricky to get the patch running properly. Fortunately, we've created a step-by-step -step guide on getting Arcanum up and running with a minimum amount of fuss. Check out the link to our guide in the description. So why go through all this trouble for a game that's old enough to order a beer? What's so special? What's the hook? Well, the opening cutscene explains it pretty well. Two big burly knights face off on the field of battle, one brandishing a magic sword, approaching with murderous intent, while the other answers back with a blast of his flintlock revolver. Then we're dumped at the main menu. You see, Arcanum takes place in an expansive fantasy wonderland that's currently going through a booming industrial revolution. The powers of magic and technology are innately incompatible with each other, and when used in close proximity to each other, they backfire with terrible results. This puts Arcanum's progressive technologists at odds with the ancient and powerful mage traditions, and not only at a philosophical level. Conflicts arose between Arcanum's nations over the explosive growth of technology, resulting in land disputes and even all-out wars. The most recent of these occurred between the large, industrialized, unified kingdom and the conservative monarchy of Cumbria, where technology is outlawed. This resulted in Cumbria's devastation. Likewise, the magic-practicing elves of the Glimmering Forest have long been at odds with the highly advanced dwarven clans in the Stonewall and Grey Mountains. The magic versus technology theme even goes far enough to entrench itself deeply in Arcanum's gameplay. An accomplished scientist type might be able to simply shrug off offensive spells, while a pistol might fail to fire in the presence of a powerful mage. This can backfire in unexpected ways when powerful magic armor becomes a regular old cosplay piece on your technologist, or when pharmaceuticals refuse to work on your wizard. Your wizard just eats handfuls, just handfuls of these drugs like M&Ms. It's just <laughs> nothing, just nothing happens. But the biggest draw, the reason why RPG fans come back to the lands of Arcanum over and over again has to be the ambitious simulation within the world itself. There's a night and day cycle, and it actually matters. Word of your deeds, or misdeeds, can precede you as you explore the vast continent and talk to its people. Want to rob that bank? You can. Or you can team up with a gun-toting vigilante to stop the bank robbery. Want to spit in the face of a king? Yeah, you can do that too. But just remember that your actions have consequences. Guillotine consequences. The immense amount of player agency in Arcanum's open world is so vast that you can befriend or murder anything and anyone while still being able to complete the main storyline, which itself has multiple endings and subplots. This is not choices matter with quotes around it. This is a game where your choices in the main quest can take some big swinging twists and turns, depending as much on the character you create and your style of play as the heavy choices you're forced to make. You can aspire to be a hero of legend or decide that maybe the big bad evil guy is not so bad after all. Or land somewhere in between. It's really up to you. Arcanum's storyline deserves even more praise for subverting expectation. After picking a pre-made protagonist, or spending several hundred hours tweaking stats and backgrounds in the character creator, 
A pre-rendered scene opens to the sight of a majestic passenger Zeppelin, the IFS Zephyr, as it speeds through the clouds. Out of nowhere, a couple of ogres flying mysterious aircraft begin machine gunning the holy hell out of the Zeppelin. Apparently ogres make shitty pilots, both dying in fiery crashes during their assault, but the Zeppelin is also knocked from the sky near the shrouded hills. From a first person perspective, you pick yourself out of the wreckage and stumble onto the only other survivor, a dying gnome who coughs a lot of confusing exposition at you before finally kicking the bucket. A prophecy, a ring, a dark one returning to kill everything, and a boy that can stop him? There's no time to process any of that as a rogue figure approaches you and spews more exposition into your face. This is Virgil. His fashion sense is terrible, and he sounds kind of like an idiot. Oh, forget it. Let, let's start at the beginning. Or this beginning, since there is a lot more that came before this. You are the reincarnation of a powerful elf who the Panari worship and whose name is, uh, right. Yes, uh, the name. Uh, wait. I remember something. It is written in the scriptures. The living one will live again on wings of fire. No, 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 wait. I think it says, reborn on wings of fire. Oh, blood and ashes. Why do elves always have to be so damn cryptic? Virgil is a newly robed Panari priest that sputters some strange gibberish about your Zeppelin crash survival being part of a prophecy. He's convinced that you are the reincarnation of the benevolent elven god and savior of the realm, Nazruddin, who is basically elf Jesus? Jesus. Uh, anyway, Virgil offers to accompany you to meet his master Joachim in order to straighten all of this out. Whether you let Virgil tag along or decide to flip him the deuces and go your own way, it won't be long before your survivor will find themselves deep in the middle of a conspiracy. As you stagger from the hills, the first of many robed hitmen will attempt to finish the job that the Zeppelin's rough landing could not. A trail of letters, telegrams, and bodies finally puts you at the doorstep of Gilbert Bates, inventor extraordinaire and iron-fisted industrialist. In another giant info dump, Bates is also being targeted by robed hitmen and puts your existing clues together to figure out that the gnome from the crash site was actually a shaved dwarf in disguise. This dwarf was a former friend of Bates and a member of the long-lost Black Mountain Clan, an extremely technologically advanced dwarf clan that disappeared under mysterious circumstances long ago. The Black Mountain Clan has either been abducted by or is working with an ancient order of assassins called the Malachian Hand. They're helping along an interdimensional being named Aranax, who has a plan in motion to return to Arcanum and, well, destroy life itself. The Hand has decided to start their campaign of anti-life with Bates, who is the only one that can reveal their secrets, and you, since you're apparently the reincarnation of the only person with enough power to stop them. Right about here is where the true brilliance of Arcanum's plot design really comes together. All this seems pretty straightforward so far. Chosen One, World in Danger, Big Bad Evil Guy. Yeah, yeah, box is checked. But the morally gray portrayals and interactions do a great job of casting doubt on all the characters, including your protagonist. When you bust into a suspicious jewelry shop run by necromancers and kill all the undead help, are you actually the aggressor? Is Bates invested in helping you, or is he just using you to get rid of the Malachian Hand? Hell, is Aranex even really trying to destroy all life, or is he trying to help all living things to transcend death? Whether you're tackling these tough questions or trading hilariously Victorian insults with members of the public, Arcanum's attention to detail is hard to surpass even today. There's a lot of ground to cover in the gameplay, but the very first thing you do in the game is have a conversation. So we might as well start here. Conversations in Arcanum are flavored by some fairly complex systems. Your player character's beauty stat can get you a better initial reaction, but charisma influences how well you can sweet talk NPCs into getting what you want. Other scores like reputation and your magical or technological prowess can cause good or bad reactions. Imagine getting chased out of the magic shop because of your tinkering hobbies, or likewise, welcomed into the gun store for the same reason. The game's karma meter is this little gauge with the violin holes right here. When leaning to the left, you're considered to be more evil, and right is more good. Certain interactions are greatly influenced by this, but at times it can seem a little unfair when your bad vibes lock you out of conversations or cause your companions to depart. 
Your chosen race and gender likewise comes into play. Playing an elf or a human generally is the conversational equivalent of white bread, and the citizenry will be normally pretty polite to you. Choosing a half-orc or half-ogre will get you a big taste of Arcanum's racism right off the bat, since these races are seen as unintelligent savages, and most of the populace will hurl insults at you in the street, overcharge you for goods and services, and generally just make your life more miserable. But orc bandits will leave you alone. The orc bandits did not leave me alone, and they did murder me the first time I revisited <laughs> this city. <laughs> yeah, but when I played as a half-orc, they were like, oh hey buddy, I'm gonna let you walk on through. Sorry, I didn't see you there, thought you were a human. Overall, while it can feel rudimentary at times, this fairly detailed social simulation is a welcome addition that pokes his head up periodically throughout Arcanum's playtime. It's definitely one of the features that makes it tempting to roll up new characters again and again. When you make that inevitable decision to start Arcanum over, you'll be pleased to know that an overwhelming amount of options exist in the game's character generator. A steampunk analog to Fallout's special system runs the die rolls here, and there's a ton of cool choices. Most Tolkienian beings are represented in the lineup, and there's a wealth of backgrounds and character traits to choose from, all of which have lasting effects on your playthrough that you'll feel for the entire game. This variety seems amazing at first look, but you might soon find yourself disappointed by the things you can't do. Wonder why half the non-human races don't have a playable female option? So do I! No female dwarves, halflings, or gnomes? Guess they reproduce by cell division. Or do they have gnarly Mad Max breeding chambers? Also, the character generator outright states that all half-orcs and half-ogres are products of rape? This fact is later contradicted in the game's own lore, where you find a heartwarming memoir from a human father that joyfully raised his bouncing half-orc baby boys with his full-blooded orcish wife. And there's only male half-ogres? How the hell am I supposed to properly roleplay my ravishing, feminine, half-ogre southern debutante when I'm limited to playing as a nine-foot dude hiding a baby arm between his legs? While there's some half-hearted attempts in the lore to hide why player choices are so limited in this way, the real reason is that they likely ran out of time and money to make all the animations for the ladies. Finding clothes and armor for large or small characters can also be a hassle, and large armor is especially rare. It's great to have all these character options, but it would have been even better if all these aspects felt finished. Once you've rolled your first character, or your fourth, you'll find that leveling and progression is handled a bit differently. There's a pretty hefty XP bonus for playing the game on easy difficulty, and a penalty for playing on hard. But the weirdest change is how Arcanum doles out a substantial amount of experience points for each strike in combat. This is a pretty sizable disadvantage if you're running a non-combat character, like a charismatic gnome, who will mostly be leveling up via questing. You won't be scraping the bottom for side quests if you suck in a fight, but on normal or hard difficulty mode, you will likely hit the level cap of 50 by about the final third of the game. The unofficial Arcanum patch has a mod to raise the level cap to 99 and spread combat XP evenly through your party, if a more traditional approach is desired. But in a game that allows this much roleplaying, it's hard to figure out why this design choice was made in the first place. In true old school RPG style, technical and artisan skills, such as bow, melee, lockpicking, bartering, and so on, are raised by sinking in some skill points when leveling up. Again, these practical skills are represented by cute little gauges and tabs over on the right. What is not immediately apparent, due to the imprecise nature of these cute little gauges, is that each skill point you pump into these bad boys actually counts as four skill points. Therefore, the skills max out at 20. Gear and magic can also provide some small incremental bonuses to these point values, and hitting the max also requires prerequisite stats. On top of this, your crash landing victim can obtain further mastery, which requires paid instruction from a trainer. Trainers for the lower skill levels are found all over the place, like city guards or shopkeepers. Through conversation, these low-level trainers sometimes provide clues to where the experts and masters might be hiding out. Some of these obscure senseis live amongst the city dwellers, blending into the locals. Others live far off the dusty trail. Sometimes lengthy questing is required to obtain mastery in a skill, as well as hitting a certain leveling threshold, and these quests are some of the best and worst Arcanum has on offer. For example, one mastery quest involves convincing a monk to break his vow of non-violence, which is both pretty cool and 
Morally questionable, very on brand for Arcanum. Another one of these involves grabbing a MacGuffin at the end of a tedious crawl through a puzzle dungeon full of teleporters, which is unfortunately also on brand with the rest of the game's many spaghetti-like dungeons. For those who are too impatient to screw around with stats in a classic CRPG, the game provides a large variety of automatic schemes that will optimize your skills and stats according to profiles, like Gun Dude, or Necromancer, or Dickhead with a Sword. I feel like this takes a lot of fun out of dinking around with stats, but works fine enough for the impatient player. Companions also have their own custom leveling schemes enabled by default. Fortunately, these can be turned off because the companion AI is dumber than freshly poured concrete. If you find a new and underleveled companion, a relatively cheap item can be purchased from outfitter shops that can bring them instantly up to your level, a feat that is incredibly impressive either by technological or magical standards. Wonder what the in-game lore explanation is for Magic Instant Leveling Book? Well, wonder away, friends, because nobody fucking knows, so... Eat it? I don't know. <laughs> Video games. Yeah. <laughs> All these minor oddities aside, you can make virtually any build work well enough to power through the main storyline. You might have to play to your strengths and get a little cheesy and creative through some of the more dangerous dungeons, but it's doable. Another move that seems strange at first glance is how the crafting and magic systems intertwine with leveling and progression. Sure, you can spend all those tasty new skill points to level up your stats or skills, or you can plop one down to pick out a single new spell or recipe. Crafting might seem underwhelming at first, why learn how to make a battery when you can shoot gun better? But once you chop up a pile of cocaine and tobacco to make your first homebrew fatigue restorer, or rummage through the trash to mix a lethal Molotov cocktail, you start to see the utility. You might end up spending a lot of time digging through the garbage to find components, but those big city trash cans get filled every few hours, so have fun being a dumpster diving inventor. To supplement the crafting is a right proper grid inventory, shown right here next to the standard paper doll equipment screen. Any worthy technologist will likely have this grid filled to the brim with all manner of crafting refuse. Now, I loves me a right proper grid inventory, but there is also a character weight limit that rapidly fills up and slows your walking speed as you traverse Arcanum's realms. This proper grid inventory is super super tiny, and will probably fill up with junk before you even leave the first map. So managing space and weight and identifying what to leave behind quickly becomes a priority. You're gonna be spending a lot of time playing inventory Tetris. You also better get ready to saddle up them their followers and get them ready for their new careers as loot mules. Yeehaw! The initial roster of recipes seems pretty thin at first, but schematics can be found or purchased from other inventors, and provided you have the right cross-section of skills, you can make some pretty mean-looking inventions for you and your companions to unleash on the unsuspecting world. Clanking around in your robot suit and introducing the dangerous ends of grenade launchers and machine guns to Arcanum's host of murderous fantasy creatures is an amazingly weird and wonderful juxtaposition. Leaning into spells or practical skills and technology also raises your magical aptitude or technical expertise accordingly and by a significant number. This is denoted by this little gauge even further on the right over here, and brings one of Arcanum's central themes into play. The more technologically advanced your character becomes, the less effective magic will be for you, down to outright failing when you even attempt to receive a simple heal spell and nullifying the magic in that shiny new magic sword. On the magical side of the street, you can start with something boring like a straight damage spell. It's called Harm. Not even a good name. But you quickly progress to cool stuff like summoning hordes of angry zombies and pulling the tortured souls of your victims back from the grave for further tormenting purposes. The more interesting spells are actually the utility spells. Raising someone's opinion of you with a charm before speaking to them can help turn the tide of conversation in your favor. Calming a pack of angry wolves before they can rip off your legs proves pretty useful in the wilderness. Teleporting around the continent sure saves on shoe leather. Again, the farther you lean into the mystical arts, the farther your arcane aptitude shoots to the top of the gauge. That might make those homemade cocaine fatigue restorers lose effectiveness, but will greatly increase the stab and power of that same shiny new magic sword. Unfortunately, your spells are powered by the same thing that keeps you conscious. 
Yep, that blue gauge on the right, the one that looks like it should be mana, that's your fatigue meter. And when it runs out, it's basically a death sentence. Getting hit, running away in combat, and swinging a weapon can also reduce your fatigue meter. This is a pretty neat survival mechanic. It adds a certain element of danger and realism to each of the fights, but it also has a major impact on caster type characters. The fatigue meter comes back with a quick snooze outside of combat, which is fortunate since using your powers can cause the gauge to drain quicker than an open bar at a Christmas party. Yeah. When this happens, your wannabe wizard passes out and face plants in the middle of the fight, which usually ends in getting pummeled to death by enemies. So, to keep you in the blue, you're gonna chug gallons upon gallons of this handy blue juice, which you can conveniently buy from shady looking witches that camp outside major settlements. It's finally time to talk about the biggest mechanic we've been dancing around and the one you'll be spending a large portion of your time with. We mean, of course, Arcanum's combat system, or really, systems. Arcanum defaults to real time combat. It's not great. Real-time combat is frantic, jerky, and hard to parse. The game plays like a cut-rate Diablo clone in real-time mode, and it's difficult to control due to the litany of key commands and missing quality of life features. An item highlight would have been nice, for example, or the ability to rebind the game's keyboard-filling control scheme. While real-time has some utility, like using it as an auto-battler option against lobby enemies, or cheesing bosses while your companions hit them in the butt crack, the real-time combat feels poorly implemented and somewhat out of place. This confusing choice to include a real-time mode may be due to the influence of Diablo 2. At the time, this was the reigning RPG king, which preceded Arcanum's release only by a little over a year. But little common ground lies between these two games, other than their isometric perspective. Later on, in 2003, Black Isle would go on to produce Lionheart Legacy of the Crusader, which would have the same ill-advised real-time mode emphasized even more and was met with a lot of thumbs downs, a lot of unfollows. <laughs> This may also have been an attempt to keep the game from looking dated. Turn-based games were seen as passe in the early 2000s, with GPU-powered shooters taking center stage, and blockbusters like Halo and GTA 3 coming out just a few months later. It also could have been due to the game's multiplayer mode, which seems to be stripped out from the newer digital releases. That's right, Arcanum was playable over local area network, and even included a level editor tool for aspiring dungeon masters. While the tools were pretty rudimentary and the resulting maps and campaigns reflected this, it's still a pretty cool idea. Still, the misguided attempts to align Arcanum with ARPGs like Diablo do the game a great injustice. This is a game for the patient, best experienced in single player and best enjoyed at a thoughtful pace. We need a big aside here before we carry on because this needs to be said and I didn't know where else to say it. This is one game where you want to read the fucking manual, or at least skim it. Otherwise you'll likely miss out on important details. The manual is a beast of a booklet, it weighs in at 187 pages, but it's written like a 19th century textbook, complete with faux science experiments and a recipe for halfling banana bread. If you find yourself running into questions like what the hell does NP stand for, the manual has a glossary and an index for looking up this kind of stuff. And if you loathe reading, well, Arcana might not be the game for you. Uh, there's a lot of reading. <laughs> it's pretty much a book, but then you take some time to do some uh, combat. <laughs> yep, pretty much that. Games in the 90s and naughty aughts often had companion books with tips and secrets. In case you aren't a bunch of jaded geezers like us and have no clue what we're talking about, they looked like this. Prima Publishing knocked these out by the truckload back in the day, since not everyone had the internet in their pocket and Arcanum seems like a game that shipped with one of those big old companion guidebooks. And what do you know, it did! But if you don't have the 50 bucks to track one down on eBay, there's a densely packed wiki page. Now that's what I call progress! Anyways, back to the combat task at hand. Do yourself a favor and just poke that enter key to switch into turn-based mode. There's a menu option to default combat to turn-based as well. This makes the gameplay much more similar to its progenitor Fallout, and thousands of times more enjoyable. Once the fights are slowed down, Arcanum starts to click. You begin to notice all the little tooltip details. There's a complex damage model at work behind the scenes with tons of different resistances and effects. There's a called shot system, 
completely buried in the game's controls. Certain attacks can have special effects or failures, like weapon malfunctions or knockback. Critical hits and misses can change up an encounter in an instant, and the more tools that become available, the more possibilities come to light. Blinding and stunning enemies will keep you alive and buy time to heal up. Building up poison levels and slow effects on that tough monster can grind him down before he smashes you into paste. Learning how to use stealth and terrain to your advantage is not just a possibility, it's a vital strategy. Plus then you get this wonderfully goofy sneaking animation. And if an encounter is still too hard, you can always just save scum. The enemy AI is hit and miss, but complex enough to drop a few surprises. Sometimes the bad guys will run away, go for reinforcements, or try to flank you. Other times they'll get stuck in a door and die of stupidity. Your companions use the same AI, so it's a level stupidity playing field. They tend to charge into fights, have some problems using offensive magic, and often try to heal to the point of passing out. The devs must have realized this shortcoming because they added a menu and hotkeys which can be used to issue simple orders to your smooth-brained colleagues. This works only sometimes, but helps tell your buddies whether to attack or back off instead of rushing into your carefully placed traps and bombs. It would have been much nicer to have control over the companions directly. Instead, your buddies work best and survive longest when they're leveled up into brain-dead, sword-swinging loot mules. Companion idiocy is still not enough to kill the enjoyment of taking them along for the adventure, and if anything it adds to the chaos, and the companions themselves have some of the best quest lines. I want to find out why Magnus only pretends to know dwarf culture, because he's real real bad at hiding it. Why did Gar the Orc end up as a museum piece? Virgil clearly has not been a priest for very long, so what's he hiding in his past? Some of the companion stories are on par with the main quest, and every time they chimed in with a little nugget of information, I was excited to see what they'd reveal about themselves. Since we're already on the subject, there's a lot to like when it comes to Arcanum's quest design. It leans heavily on the written word and remembering conversations, and definitely lends itself to whipping out a paper and pen with the bulk of clues thrown at you from every direction. The amount of agency tossed in the player's lap is immense, and the in-game quest log is woefully inadequate and vague. No hand-holding here! Certain early choices can determine whether or not your crash victim gets access to entire factions and quest lines, like the Thieves Underground, and the game is forgiving enough to provide multiple chances to redeem yourself in most cases. There's more than one way to get through the main plot, and the journey along the way is a tangle of interesting choices and outcomes that still somehow push you in either a generally good or evil path, while still making sure that the endings tie up your loose ends. Arcanum both echoes and expands on the branching story designs of its Fallout predecessors while serving as an inspiration for some of the greatest epic RPG stories out there. There's a massive number of quests, both big and small, throughout the game's runtime. Some of the side quests can shake entire societies and influence the direction of civilizations, and the game isn't afraid to show you the lasting results of your actions as the ending rolls. It's easy to see here how the RPGs of today like Dragon Age and Outer Worlds took cues from the old 2D character-based games of yesterday. Oh, and you thought we were done with mechanics? Nope. It's like you thought we were done talking about Magic Obscura. Yeah, right? Uh-uh. But no, we're going to talk more about both mechanics and magicians. Yup, we sure is. Why didn't they call it Mechanics and Magicians? I don't know. That would have been a good name, though. Uh, and shorter, shorter name. Yeah, it clearly tells what the game is about. Yeah. Good name, good game, that's all I gotta say. There's this little counter at the top that tracks fate points, which are points that can be used as sort of a freebie if you want a critical success or other favorable result on demand. This works kind of like inspiration in D&D 5th edition, so why bring this up now? Well, you can only obtain these fate points on rare occasions during main quest milestones, which can make it easy to forget that the mechanic's even there. Which is what we almost did. On the whole, Arcanum holds up surprisingly well for a game that is considered dated at release. Still, there's some issues that are a little less palatable for today's RPG enthusiast. Most of these lie within the realm of interface and quality of life problems. A pretty big piece of screen real estate is taken up by the UI. The wood grain and brass approach with all these neat greebles and gauges is definitely memorable and cool looking. I can't think of more than a couple games that lean into this style even 20 years later. 
The font can be hard to parse, though, since it looks like it was pulled straight from the printing blocks of an 1890s newspaper. Fortunately, the unofficial patch has some options to further alter the field of play and increase the font size for today's displays, but these mods don't scale the UI, so finding a happy medium between graphic fidelity and usability falls to the player once again. This probably becomes the biggest issue on the travel screen, where clicking around can be a bit imprecise due to map shrinkage. It's cold out there, people. Watch out for map shrinkage. Graphics are going for that 2D isometric dirtiness that we first saw in Fallout 1 and 2, and it's easy to draw the through lines to Arcanum style. Where Fallout had a dusty palette of browns and yellows, Arcanum gives much of its world an appropriately grimy oil and iron look. The environments suffer from a lot of sameness in the early areas. Tons of repeating tiles and endless forests of the same few trees take up a lot of the mainland. But eventually you'll reach frozen villages nestled in mountainous tundra, desert islands, and lush jungles. The game can look dead and static at times. For example, the water doesn't move, trees don't blow in the breeze. However, there's a decent amount of dynamic lighting, which actually affects stealth and combat, and some of the interior locations are highly detailed. The graphical highlights lie largely in the giant, lovingly rendered set pieces. Tarant is a bustling industrial metropolis, complete with a new addition of electric streetlights. In contrast, Dernhold is a ruined seaside kingdom, and the deterioration of the castle and the surrounding buildings shows that its recent war didn't go so well for them. Even with the muted palette, there are some impressive looking set pieces like the clipper ships at the docks of Tarant or the Henge outside of Roseboro. Character animations are a bit rough, and this seems to be where some last minute crunch decisions were made. Attack animations can look jerky and strange, but there's a whole lot of them, so I cut the game some slack here for the sheer variety factor. Much of your gear is reflected on your character, meaning even more animation sets were needed here. Less care is put into the non-humanoid enemies, but some of these have some really awesome designs. Killer automatons, spider women of the desert, man-eating gorillas, the enemy variety is on point, and the monster designs are extremely memorable. Sound effects can be grating and repetitive, there's no way around it. Most of the combat sounds can stack up and just cause this wall of noise in the middle of a big fight. They do the job, but I tended to turn down the sounds in order to give my ears a break. The music tracks, on the other hand, are excellent. Rather than a traditional epic fantasy orchestra, Arcanum has a score written for string quartet. But ambient industrial pads and effects kick in alongside the beautifully recorded string section to make something new and wonderful. The single drawback is the extremely repetitive combat song. After the first 30 minutes of hearing the same violin hit, followed by dun 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 dun, I was over it. Fortunately, it's mods to the rescue once more. There's a mod included in Drug Blacktooth's patch that simply turns off the combat track, letting you enjoy the music to its fullest. My absolute favorite part of Arcanum's sound design is the voiceover work. There's a ton of it, it's well recorded, and it's well acted. What in the name of all that is holy would make you deign to address me? Seriously great performances spill out from companions and quest givers, and although not every NPC has voice lines, the ones that do feel like a rare treat. They claimed rights as the afflicted, and therefore as the judges. They agreed that exile was a suitable punishment, but they wanted to be the vessel of that retribution. I didn't skip a single line, but instead savored it like a fine wine, and let those performances breathe life into Arcanum's world. And what a world it is. The strange, forceful struggles between magic and tech, the juxtaposition of steam and sword, and the morally gray choices presented to the player at every turn help make Arcanum a memorable cult classic that should be enjoyed by all fans of good reading and great world building. It's flawed and it's messy at times, but it's also beautiful, funny, engaging, and enraging at others. There's also a ton of just really cool stuff that we didn't have time to mention elsewhere, like the secret flying guillotine, or the in-game nudges to the Fallout series, or the fact that character portraits are based on historical figures as well as the game's development staff, or the litany of uniquely cursed magic items. So why have we never seen another foray into this fantastic setting? Well, we've touched on a few of these in passing already. Publisher pressure likely was a contributing factor, and bad timing was another. There's also the fact that technology was moving fast in 2001. 
and Arcanum already felt pretty dated by the time it debuted. The gaming market was changing just as quickly. Arcanum isn't fast or smooth or flashy, it's a practice in patience, strategy, and deliberation. You know, role-playing. But the real money was in games that were big, fast, and dumb. Trying to pass off this deep narrative as an ARPG clickfest feels like a move doomed to failure. There's also just the plain fact that Fallout has bigger mass appeal. The setting is simply more marketable as we've found out over the years. Tongue-in-cheek approaches to nuclear annihilation and cutesy cartoon mascots tend to win out over gentlemanly language and locomotives for most of the game-consuming public. And by this point in time, the Fallout franchise already had three games under its belt. The biggest reason might just come down to crunch. Based on release dates, Troika was likely a servant with too many masters. Each of its three games probably had a significant period of development overlap, and each of its three games were being published by a different company, which means this relatively small studio was subject to three different sets of demands at all times. While rushing and crunching to meet these demands, they ended up with three roughshod but uniquely memorable darlings of PC gaming that are still well-loved to this day for the most part. When Troika closed its doors after being outbid on Fallout 3 by Bethesda, gaming suffered a great loss. An early tech demo of a Troika-developed Fallout 3 was teased in early 2005, right before the studio shuttered. Maybe in an alternate universe, Troika was allowed to take back the license. Maybe we would have seen a follow-up to Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, imagine that. Or a Source Engine-powered sequel to Arcanum, which was reportedly already in the works at the time Troika folded. I guess we'll never find out what might have happened in the alternate universe. But on the off chance you work at the Large Hadron Collider and happen to grab a copy of Arcanum 2 from the Mirror Dimension, I beg you, please drop a copy in our inbox. Anyways, that does it for today. Do you have some cherished memories of Arcanum? What would you like to see Troika develop if they were still around today, or in the Mirror Universe? And again, if you like what we're doing here on the channel, or if we helped you get Arcanum up and running, please give us some love and share this video to the outer reaches of the internet. You know, tweet, Facebook, smoke signal, whatever it is you do best. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you on the next Two-Headed Hero.